Good morning to all the esteemed guests. We'll start the session at 10 32. Uh, request all the moderator, moderators and respective speakers to be on screen. Oh, good morning. Good morning, one and all. Uh, in the words of Justice William Orwell Douglas, Judge U.S. Supreme Court, the longest standing U.S. Judge in the Supreme Court, he said, and I quote, the liberties of none are safe unless the liberties of all are protected. Who better epitomizes the aforesaid than Justice H.R. Khanna himself, who has been a beacon of civil personal liberties. With these words, I have the privilege and the honor to commence the third edition of Justice H.R. Khanna Memorial Symposium, and who to better kickstart the proceedings than the Vice Chancellor of my alma mater, NLIU Bhopal, Professor Suri Prakash. Professor Dr. Suri Prakash is a professor of law specializing in dispute settlement process. He is currently serving as the Vice Chancellor of the National Law Institute University, Bhopal, since 1st June 2023. Prior to his current position, he served as the Vice Chancellor of Damodaram. National Law University, Vishakapatnam, and as the founder of the Vice Chancellor of the Maharashtra National Law University, Aurangabad. He has over 35 years of experience in academia and administration and has worked as lecturer, principal, and faculty member at various institutions, including NEGS Kolkata, DNR College of Law, Andhra Pradesh, and Law College in Nanded, Maharashtra. He holds a BL degree from Acharya Nagarjuna University, Guntur, Andhra Pradesh, and a Master of Law degree from Andhra University. With a specialization in labor and industrial laws, he received the prestigious VN Dikshu Award for securing the highest marks in labor law during his academic career. He later obtained his PhD in law from Bhimapur University, Odisha. Professor Surya Prakash is a prolific writer and has published works on various contemporary issues, his notable works including Bonded Labor and Social Justice, 1990, and Turning Point, the Story of Law Teacher, 2009. A biography of Professor N. R. Madhav Menon, which explores the national school movement in India. And he has also edited books on critical issues and international commercial arbitration, 2012, and perspectives on mediation, 2012. Some special noted achievements of Professor Surya Prakash includes he being invited to study the US judicial system by the State Department, USA, under the auspices of International Visitor Leadership Program in 2010. The study tour provided insights into the US judicial system, including judicial training at Federal Judicial Center, Washington, State Judicial Center, Lansing, Michigan, and legal education in different law schools in India. Professor Surya Prakash has also authored various books on bonded labor, social justice, as well as on various other labor and international commercial arbitration issues. He has written about 25 articles on the topics such as bonded labor, child labor, trade unions, sexual harassment of women, and in workplace, the Indian judiciary, plea bargaining, mediation, international commercial arbitration, and human rights, which have been published in all reputed law journals across the globe. Professor Surya Prakash has presented more than 40 research papers at various national and international seminars and conferences, and has worked on the projects of interstate migrant labor and report 
writing of projects on access to justice in 2009 for the High Court of Madhya Pradesh. He prepared the manual on legal health issues and compendium on agriculture and allied laws for the state of Madhya Pradesh. And he's also the founder editor of the Indian Law Review, a law journal of NLIU Bhopal. He's also participated in the international visitor leadership programs organized by the State Department USA and where he has studied the US judicial system, receiving training at the Federal Judicial Center. Has served as the chairman of the Center for Business and Commercial Laws at faculty in charge of the EDR cell at NLIU. And with such stellar academic record, Professor Suru Prakash is the apt person to reflect on the today's topic and give his welcome remarks. I welcome Professor Suru Prakash to give the welcome address. Thank you, Sankal. Good morning to all. Good morning to Honorable Justice M.M. Uh, Sundareshji, Senior Advocate Sri Krishna Kaurji, and Mr. Shyam Divan, very popular even in uh, the state of Andhra Pradesh. <laughs> Divan Srivastav, my student uh, who is instrumental for this Khan Foundation, Siddharth Gupta, and all my dear colleagues and student friends and dignitaries who are watching this particular uh, event. So I'm very glad to return to my university for which I am associated since 2003, where I was uh, associate professor, professor, and uh, without any hesitation, I can say that today, whatever I am, it's because of NLIU Gopal. And coming to the Third Justice HR Kanna Memorial National Symposium, the task given to me, I have to introduce the subject and I could not resist saying a few words about Honorable Justice Ansaraj Khannaji. So when we are uh, conducting this program, undoubtedly Honorable Justice HR Khanna, whenever we think of the Supreme Court of India, the first thing that will come to our mind is Honorable Justice H.R. Karnaji. So the importance of the Memorial Symposium is pinfold. I consider that first we remember and express the noble soul that we have not forgotten him. Because still we adore and we respect him. Secondly, we also tell him that on this occasion, we are saying on solemn affirmation that we would endeavor to tread the path which was led by his wisdom. It is not mere celebrations, but also to understand Honorable Justice Kanmaji to follow. Because as you know that uh, one single dissenting opinion is the cause of celebration for today's uh, national symposium. There are so many judges, there are high court, Supreme Court. And in my considered opinion, Honorable Justice H.R. Kanmaji he is a complete judge. Why I'm saying complete judge? Because he had the experience in the trial court. And uh, to see, look at his uh, brief bio, Honorable Justice Khanna was born on July 3rd, 1912, and educated mostly from high school, uh, Hindu College, Amritsar, Khalsa College, and he had his law graduation from uh, Law College, Lahore. And he, as a pleader, he practiced in the Amrutsar till 1952, till he was appointed as district judge. So here, he practiced in the trial court and he know the procedures and what are the problems in the trial court. And then he was elevated as uh, uh, when the, to the judge of Punjab High Court. And when the Delhi High Court was formed, he became judge of uh, Delhi High Court and then the chief justice of Delhi High Court in 1969, and he was appointed as Judge Supreme Court of India in 1971, till he resigned in 1977. And, and uh, he passed away in the year 2008. So this is his uh, biographical sketch, biologically. And now, coming back to Honorable Justice Kanna, because in the course of today's uh, program, people will discuss about the right to privacy, particularly from ADM Jabalpur to the other cases. And apart from his uh, judgments, and we celebrate the Charkana only for uh, this, uh, what you call, uh, 
ADM Jabalpur case. So if you look at the contributions of Justice HR Kanna, he was on in the Supreme Court, 193 benches of the Supreme Court. He delivered only one decision as a single judge. And he sat on 79 division benches, 59 full benches, four full benches comprising of four judges, and 50 constitutional benches, 42 five judge benches, six seven judges bench, one nine judges bench, and one 13 judge bench. And apart from the constitutional law, he has decided more on 71 case matters in taxation law and 49 in criminal law, including preventive detention, third highest number of cases, 38 in constitutional law, including land reforms and on other cases. So the legal acumen of Honorable Justice uh, H.R. Kanna, I would like to how simply he has interpreted Article 368. Because I could not resist unless I could bring a couple of things which reflect the wisdom of Justice Kannaji. To quote, in case one on the Bharati case, I quote, Article 368 contains provisions relating to amendment of the Constitution. No words are to be found in Article 368 as may indicate that a limitation was intended on the power of making amendment of part three with a view to take away or abridge fundamental rights. On the contrary, the words used in Article 368 are if the procedure prescribed by that article is complied with, the constitution shall stand amended. The words to underline, the constitution shall stand amended, plainly cover the various articles of the constitution and I find it difficult in the face of those clear and unamb unambiguous words to exclude from other operation the articles relating to fundamental rights in part three of the constitution. So this is the entire gist of Keshwananda Bharti's case. So there are a number of hundreds of pages, but article 368 was given a simple interpretation as there are no restrictions or reservations in the amending power of the constitution. And apart from these uh, uh, judicial decisions, and Kana, also a prolific writer, and he is one of his, uh, I have been, when I was invited by Siddharth Bhutra, I have been searching for the literature, and one such article published in SEC 1979, SCC Journal 17, that is Role of Judges by H.R. Kanna. I would like to bring what is a great judgment. In the words of Honorable Justice Kanna, a great judgment, it has been said, must take deep account of day before yesterday in order that yesterday may not paralyze today. And it must take account of what if decrease for today in order that today may not paralyze tomorrow. So past, present and future, he has explained. He went on saying, words in statutes are not unlike words in foreign language in that they, have, they too have associations, echoes and overtones. Judges must retain the association, hear the echoes and capture the overtones. The law today has outgrown its primitive stage of formalism when the precise words was the sovereign talisman. To understand and construe the law, one must enter into the spirit in setting and its history. So he went on saying this is a very long article. In fact, this is a speech delivered by Honorable Justice Karna in, uh, I think, in Delhi High Court Bar Association, Ahmedabad. There are also other speeches published. So it's, uh, I consider that it's my honor to introduce this uh, symposium, which is named after uh, Honorable Justice uh, Richard Kannaji, and also being the founder editor of Indian Law Review. In 2016, we released a special volume on Richard Kanna. The entire, that's the reason why I am proficient rather 
all uh, matters about honorable justice Khanna. And yes, I was allotted only 10 minutes. It would be so difficult to compress an epic into an epigram. But just I have only touched the tip of the iceberg of the judicial acumen of Justice Karnaji. And then coming back to our topic, the much discussed, much uh, debated topic of right to privacy, right from A.K. Gopalan to the recent Putu Swami's case, the debate is going on on right to privacy. What are the parameters? What are the limitations where we have to draw the Lakshman Rekha? Because right to privacy is important as well as the security of the nation. Because somewhere if the encroachment or the abrasions may take place. And one student, sometime back when I was uh, at, uh, in my previous university, asked me, while discussing this Puttuswami's case in one of the seminars, sir, in Puttuswami's case, it is uh, particularly against giving this uh, thumb impression and uh, uh, how to protect this, uh, all this uh, information about the individuals or the citizens. Sir, most of the people I found, that is the upper uh, layers in the society, when we go to USA or UK, if we, in India, if we give our fingertips, uh, sorry, fingerprints in the US embassy, they will be available all over US in every police station, in every airport. In the transit in London or in uh, Germany, Frankfurt or anywhere, we pass through a glass chamber and where there will be entire body scanning will take place. So when we give our all of our uh, biographical details to the foreign countries, in the foreign airports, in the, for the sake of the nation, for security, because unless we are secure, we cannot exercise our fundamental rights, including our right to privacy. So what is wrong? Then I said that, okay, there is nothing wrong, but however, they should, not, they should be preserved and they should not fall into the wrong hands. So with these few words, I welcome Honorable Justice M.M. Sundareshi. Undoubtedly, this is going to be uh, a symposium enriching the young students and also the teachers. And this is a fusion of a bar and bench and the illegal universities. Thank you, Coacher. I think that I didn't cross my time. No. But I'll maybe one and a half minutes, so I could not resist. Thank you very much for giving me the wonderful opportunity. Thanks a lot, Professor Surya Prakash. You're always on time. In fact, you always conclude and uh, you make the best of the time you always have. Uh, Justice H.R. Khanna was not only beacon of personal liberties, but at the same time, he not only took up personal liberties, but also valued fundamental rights to the hilt. Today, we are in the third edition of this lecture series. And I call upon everyone to just observe one minute of silence in his remembrance. And we'll start now and just have one minute of remembrance of Justice H.R. Khanna and then we start the session. Thank you, sir. Should we raise? No, we can sit, sir. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We commence the session now, and it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce the panel today, and a stellar one at that. 
we have the chief guest honorable justice mm sundaresh judge supreme court of india we have senior advocate mr s guru krishna kumar who is senior advocate of the supreme court of india mr sham diwan who needs no introduction also senior advocate supreme court of india and i have been called upon to introduce the shining star and a champion of personal liberties and freedom that's honorable justice mm sundaresh judge supreme court of india and i apologize if i leave out anything regarding the long curriculum vitae if i may say so or the the resume of honorable justice sundaresh where we share just one thing in common apart from anything else being cricketers it i was so happy to see that honorable justice sundaresh is such a sportsman and a bowler and i was an opening batsman in uh, the county cricket in england so I, i i would be happy to face honorable justice sundaresh some day hopefully honorable justice sundaresh was born on july 21st 1962 in road tamil nadu and he completed his schooling and education in road itself he then went on to earn a bachelor's of arts degree from loyola college chennai and subsequently did his law at madras law college justice sundaresh was enrolled as an advocate in the bar council of tamil nadu and puducherry in 1985 and he began his practice as a lawyer in the madras high court and specialized in civil criminal and writ matters he served as the counsel for the corporation for development small scale industries additionally he was also appointed as the member of the monitoring committee to oversee the establishment of the rivers osmosis system to the dying units in the districts by the honorable madras high court he also served as a government leader from 1991 to 1996 and is also known amongst the members of the bar for his presentation of cases and his quick grasp on legal principles in his initial days justice sundaresh learned the art of advocacy from legal luminaries such as thiru s siva subramaniam who later became a judge of high court and his father thiru v k muthuswami senior advocate justice sundaresh was appointed as an additional judge of the madras high court on march 31st 2009 and confirmed as a permanent judge of the high court on march 29 2011 He had a brilliant career at the high court spanning 12 years where he served at both the principal bench and the madurai bench his efficiency is reflected in his high disposal of cases and during his stint uh, as the high court judge he disposed of a staggering 1,3563 cases you may beat that he is a man of great convictions a person who has highest regard for morals and values this can be gleaned from his farewell speech at the madras high court where he said and i quote I might have given many good or bad judgments, but not a single judgment against my conscience. That reflects upon the mindset of Justice Sundaresh. Justice Sundaresh was elevated as the judge of the Supreme Court of India on August thirty first, two thousand twenty one. He follows cricket ardently and is also a great player on the field. His passion for the sport is well known across judges and lawyers alike. Recognized for his stellar bowling skills, he has been instrumental in organizing the cricket matches and leading the judges' team for various tournaments. So widely known are his skills. that the chief justice of india once referred to him as the dashing captain of the supreme court teams in his farewell function justice l nageshwar rao quite fondly asked the bar to beware since justice sundaresh is there as he was sure to take the trophy home justice sundaresh has a passion for literature he often has coat up his sleeve nowhere is this more apparent than his judgment including prakash nai was the state of goa and i quote he said while dealing with section 84 of the ipc he said that by quoting and analyzing hamlet a literary classic penned by shakespeare in chairman bar council of india versus chairman and secretary bar council of tamil nadu speaking about the importance of lawyers he again referred to the play of the henry the 6th thereafter in maya appliances versus butterfly he refers again to bard quoting how cleopatra's beauty captivated mark antony the matter concerned the designs act 2000 we are sure he has whipped up something appropriate for the occasion today as well as reflected throughout his career from the cases he dealt with justice sundaresh is extremely environmentally conscious in 2019 while at the madras high court justice sundaresh authored a judgment taking a view on how invasive species can cause harm to local environment and hamper attempts at preservation this evinces his foresight and expertise on such a niche environmental issue interestingly he has also opened up a quote from hubert reeves and i quote man is the most insane species he worships an invisible god and destroys a visible nature unaware that this nature he is destroying is this god he is worshiping notably he has also directed the central bureau of investigation into elephant poaching incidents in the aforementioned case 
In 2022, Justice Sundresh drew a beautiful analogy and reference to Section 34 of the IPC in the case of Jasdeep Singh versus State of Punjab, and which was decided on 7th of January 22. And I quote, a striker may hit the target while a keeper may stop and attack. The consequence of the match, either a win or a loss, is borne by all the players, though they may have their distinct roles. A goal scored or saved may be the final act, but the result is what matters. As against the specific individuals who had impacted more, the result is shared between the players. The same logic is the foundation of Section 34 of the IPC, which creates shared liability on those who share the common intention to commit the crime. Justice Sundresh, while delivering a judgment on the issue of online classes during the pandemic, in the case of R. Paneswaran versus government of Tamil Nadu, said, and I quote, and while he quoted Swami Vivekananda, we want the education by which character is formed, strength of mind is increased, the intellect is expanded, and by which one can stand on one's own feet. And also stated that Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan explains education through the following statement. Education is the means by which we can tidy up our minds, acquire information, as well as a sense of values. Education should give us not only elements of general knowledge or technical skills, but also impart to us that bent of mind, that attitude of reason, that spirit of democracy, which will make us responsible citizens of our country. His dedication to preserving the environment is also evidenced in his work at Supreme Court of India. In the earliest days of his tenure, he urged the central government to take up steps to implement the proposal by the TSR Subramaniam Committee for establishment of an independent Indian Environment Service as an all India institution within the government, meant to tackle all environmental issues. Amongst his many other qualities, Justice Sundaresh is most importantly an ardent believer in individual liberty and is well evident from his penmanship in the judgment of Satyan Kumar Antle versus CBI. We find that in most appeals for the grant of bail, his seminal judgment in Satyan Kumar Antle is relied upon the principles enunciated therein. In the judgment dated 11th of July 2022, which starts with the quote from John E. D. in the Essays of, on Freedom and Power, he says, liberty is one of the most essential requirements of modern man. It is said to be the delicate fruit of a mature civilization. It is the very quintessence of civilized existence and essence requirement of essential requirement of a modern man. This reflects the deep and profound thought of prof and the process of Justice Sundaresh. I request his Lordship to enlighten us on the topic today. Thank you. It's a gloomy and rainy day today. Thank you everyone for being present. On 30th April 1978, in an article published in the New York Times titled Fading Hope in India, two days after the historic judgment in A.D. and Jawalpur versus Shivakant Sukla, the author made an interesting comment. If India ever finds its way back to the freedom and democracy that were proud hallmarks of its first 18 years as an independent nation, someone will surely erect a monument to, the, to Justice H.R. Khanna of the Supreme Court. My dear brother, Justice Dibangar Dutta, would be joining you in the second session. Sri Mandan Kumar Mishra, attending this function online, Chairman Bar Council of India. Mr. Adish Agarwal, Agarwala, President of SCBA. Mr. Manoj Mishra, President Skora. Sri Guru Krishna Kumar and Sri Shyam Divan, senior advocates who are present here, whose speeches we are going to listen shortly. Dr. S. Suri Prakash, who is Vice Vice Chancellor at NLIU, Bhopal, who spoke eloquently and gave a good insight about the great Achar Kanna. Professor V.C. Vivekanandan, Vice Chancellor, HNLU Raipo, Srivatsava, 
Sangal Kochar, distinguished members of the bar, and my dear students. I must place on record my sincere appreciation to the Kane Foundation. His effort in making legal education accessible is truly commendable. My special thanks to the students and volunteers of Kane Foundation who have made this event possible with their untiring efforts under the able guidance of C. Siddharth Gupta. Justice Charles Stevens Hughes once famously remarked that descending judgments constitute an appeal to the intelligence of a future day. Justice Khanna's dissent not only guided the course of the history, but continues to be a leading light in upholding the spirit of the Constitution. It is indeed an honor to address this August gathering in the name of Justice H.R. Khanna. Once again, my special thanks to the organizers. The topic of the day is an ever relevant one. A fact acknowledged by, once again, by Dr. Suri Prakash. Especially in the back backdrop of the lofty ideals expounded by Justice Khanna. State surveillance and privacy. The Lakshman Rekha between. George Orwell once wrote, it was terribly dangerous to let your thoughts wander when you were in any public place or within a range of a telescreen. The smaller, smallest thing could give you away. A nervous tick an unconscious look of anxiety, a habit of muttering to yourself, which we often, very often do, both lawyers and judges, anything that carried with it the suggestion of abnormality, of having something to hide. In any case, to wear an improper expression on your face, even to look incredulous, when a victory was announced, for example, was itself a punishable offense. The term surveillance originated way back in the year 1883 in France. But the concept is actually as old as the concept of civilization itself. Understanding its contours requires a, because taking a peep into history. Marcus Tullius Cicero, who opposed Julius Caesar and his dictatorship, made a caustic remark on his letters being intercepted regularly. While addressing Titus Atticus, he said, I can't find a faithful message bearer. How few are they who are able to carry a rather weighty letter without lightening, lightening it by reading? Kautilya, in his Atasasra, devotes several chapters on the methods and objectives of a secret service. He gives some credit for the strength and success of the Mahada Empire to an organized network of skilled spies and secret agents seamlessly weave through the state of society and present throughout the country's territory. These spies constantly kept a watch on the populace and recorded their movements 
meticulously in order to identify and weed out the suspects and rebels. In India, surveillance has been used since the ancient times. The Rig Veda refers to spasa, a spice being used by the god Varna. Manuskrivni listed intelligence gathering as one of the core duties. One of the crucial responsibilities of a diplomat was sending regular updates to their home kingdom. This would include periodical reports on rival kings. Pope Gregory speaks of the role required to be played by the rulers. He says in his book, Pastoral Care, that those who lead should have eyes within and around them so that they can detect what should be corrected in others. Similarly, in the 12th century, Pope Lucius III formed various committees for gathering intelligence to oversee and monitor both the commoners and the clerics by the issuance of an edict. Much like the movies, these individuals stood in holes behind paintings and watched their targets through the false eyes of the paintings. With the onset of the Great French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity became the call of the modern society. After the French monarch was deposed, the Republican government created a committee on surveillance spanning across the country to identify aristocrats and their sympathizers. Liberty was thus both curtailed and restricted while keeping the population under constant vigil. This methodology was adopted and continued throughout the 18th and 19th centuries by different governments across Europe. Technological innovations further enhanced state's capacity for its surveillance. These inventions impacted the society by overturning the old social order. The Industrial Revolution, a product of new invention, along with colonization, changed the social structure dividing communities and changing the way of living from community-centric to families and individual-centric. This, in my view, was a turning point as recognition was accorded for the first time to, to the right to be let alone. In his treatise on law of thoughts, Thomas Cooley, in the year 1988, describes privacy. The right of one's person may be said to be a right of complete immunity, which is the right to be alone. The invention of the telegram in the 1885 by Samuel Morse was followed by voice communication by Antony Musi in 1871. Further developments were made by Alexander Graham Bell in the year 19, 1876 through the evolution of electromagnetic voice transmission. Along with the technological development, surveillance technology 
also must again. Telegraphic lines that tapped with increasing frequency and so also electro electric messages. Telephonic conversations were also tapped through the interception of electric waves initially and then by the interception of radio waves. As we travel further towards the present, we find the need for surveillance by states to be on the increase. Interestingly, both the allies and the Axis powers regularly indulged in the intersection of enemy courts through the World War II. It took a more aggressive turn even during the peace time and aggravated further during the Cold War. The power of new technology and its impact was felt by the aggressors and defenders alike. Surveillance did not stop with the enemy alone, usually foreigners, but deployed also against one's own citizenry. It is meant to be used both in the present and the future. It's a tool to act in anticipation of an untoward incident. Countries started tightening their grip over their citizens with the help of the other nations and even at times non-state actors by sharing surveillance technology and intelligence. One such agreement between the members of the Western Bloc led to the creation of the first global surveillance program called ECOLAN in 1971. The attack on the Twin Towers in New York on the dreadful day of 7 September 11, 2001 was indeed a watershed moment. About 19 perpetrators blundered into the population without arousing suspicion. Their actions caused unprecedented devastation. The need for a stronger surveillance infrastructure was duly felt, which led to the birth of the present-day PRISM program. This has had far-reaching implications as countries realized the pressing need for the increased stronger surveillance infrastructure. Accordingly, the legislations were enacted to give sweeping pass to the state agency agencies. For instance, in the United States, the prevalent situation led to the enactment of Patriot Act of 2001. This act gives enforcement agencies unbridled and uncontrolled sweeping powers to investigate individuals suspected of terrorism and other allied crimes. Talking about the modern day scenario of surveillance, the state utilizes various digital surveillance tools such as CCTVs and facial recognition cameras to monitor the activities of citizens en masse. In Forbes list of 2021, India is among the top countries having the most surveilled cities in the world. Delhi climbed the top spot with approximately 1,826.6 cameras per square mile. 
surpassing even Beijing, Wuhan, and Xiamen, as well as London. And in, this is an interesting fact. Having considered the concept of surveillance from its historical perspective, it would be beneficial to refer to the history of the concept of privacy. Privacy as a concept goes back to the time when the first human became self-aware and could articulate the idea of a self. It is something which has followed even before the arrival of today's homo sapiens. Over the years, it has become an interesting intrinsic part of human nature, a right which inheres inalienably. The great Aristotle, in his writings, made a division between the public and personal spheres. According to him, that it can be termed as an earlier recognition of an individual's right to privacy, which he refers to as a confidential zone for all the citizens. An authority was expected to limit itself only to the activities falling within the public realm as it is so defined. The state is not expected to enter the other arena concerning the individuals along with their rights. It is this division which gave, gave shape to the concept of privacy. The concept as propounded by the philosopher was further expanded by John Stuart Mills. He advocated the need to rein in the tyranny of the majority. A further expanded meaning was rendered by Granville Austin through the introduction of the idea of individual privacy to be extended even to public places. Justice Louis Bandis, a celebrated judge of the United States Supreme Court, stressed upon the invasion of one's privacy and the resultant pain that might occur. According to him, privacy is a facet of inviolable personal liberty. He thus says, the intensity and the complexity of modern life and advancing civilization have rendered necessarily some retreat from the world and man. Under the refi refining influence of culture has become more sensitive to publicity so that solitude and privacy have become more essential to the individual. But modern enterprise and invention have, through invasion upon his privacy, subjected him to mental pain and distress far greater than could be inflicted by mere bodily injury. When Warren and Brandis argue in favor of the creation of right to privacy, as we mentioned above, their main concern stemmed from the dangers caused by recent inventions. In particular, photography was an emblematic contemporary invasion, innovation, I'm sorry, enabling the unauthorized circulation of portraits of private persons. With the advancement of technology, privacy has become more of a concern. While the former is beneficial to the mankind, the latter has to be protected. The use of technology 
exposes the privacy of an individual which he does not like to disclose technology does facilitate access to privacy of others that's the reason why justice bandis did make the limitation that the little notice revolutions have made the personal lives and personalities of individuals increasingly accessible to others through the telegraph telephone portable cameras to name few the can the concept of privacy is not new to our country either ancient texts including dharma shastras and hirup the says place certain matters like worship family and sex firmly outside the public domain questions over the, the very existence of god and rituals were freely discussed at length and decisions were left to the individuals even to the extent of mocking at the chanting of mantras by comparing them to a croaking voice of a toad were found acceptance on the judicial side one need not travel beyond the celebrated judgment in the case of putasami versus union of india a fact once again taken note of and spoken about by professor s yes, uh, suriprakash the supreme court has recognized the right to privacy as a basic and core one subject to reasonable restrictions it found a place for privacy in part 3 of the constitution with specific reference to article 21 the need for looking into the future and the understanding of the constitution in protecting and upholding privacy has been spoken at length the supreme court in the process overall the early decisions in mp sharma versus satish chandra and karak singh versus shota uttar pradesh rendering them the governing law no longer in so far as the concept of privacy is concerned the court the court gave its imprimatur to the historic decisions rendered in rc cooper and menaka gandhi by reiterating that the fundamental rights envisaged in part 3 of the constitution are to be understood by reading the articles together and therefore not in isolation while doing so the court has rightly sounded a word of caution that such a right is not an absolute one having declared so it was further held that there must be a law in existence to justify an encroachment on privacy such a law should have a legitimate objective and rational behind it it must conform to the constitutional mandate and pass the muster of the doctrine of proportionality it is imperative to, to take note of the ringing observation in the leading judgment of case potasam now would this court in interpreting the constitution freeze the content of constitutional guarantees and provisions to what the founding fathers perceived the constitution was drafted and adopted in a historical context the vision of the founding fathers 
was enriched by the his by the histories of suffering of those who suffered oppression and a violation of dignity both here and elsewhere yet it would be difficult to dispute that many of the problems which contemporary societies faced would not have been present to the minds of the most specific ecclesiastes tasman no generation including the present can have a monopoly over solutions or the confidence in its ability to foresee the future as society evolves so must constitutional doctrines the institutions which the constitution has created must adopt flexibility to meet the challenges in a rapidly growing knowledge economy above all constitutional interpretation is but a process in achieving justice liberty and dignity to every citizen no generation including the present can have a monopoly over solutions or the confidence in his ability to foresee the future as society evolves so must constitutional doctrine the supreme court further reflects the constitutional interpretation in a process i quote in achieving justice liberty and dignity to every citizen in view of the two landmark judgments in putasami 1 and 2 rendered in the year 2017 and 19 respectively the right to privacy has firmly entrenched itself as an inviolable fundamental right therefore the state is expected to act in recognition of the said right imposing its restrictions by applying the doctrine of proportionality and and satisfying the constitutional mandate having understood the need for existence and the importance of the right to privacy for a human being one cannot be un- unmindful of the present day need for surveillance surveillance and privacy must live and function together as long as there is privacy surveillance will certainly continue the modern world has indeed become a difficult place to live and to maintain its peace the cost of peace is obviously very very high any state which lacks expert surveillance would be considered a weak one and and susceptible to attack from unknown sources it is vulnerable both externally and internally it may also be required in the larger interest of the public while agreeing the surveillance has become an integral part of governance the concern is with respect to its exercise particularly in cases involving one citizens technology has become a part of investigation methodologies it becomes increasingly difficult to bring a criminal case to its logical conclusion only with the help of ocular witnesses alone crimes do not always happen in the presence of a human being they have become more complicated even otherwise human memory is rather vulnerable 
Moreover, the nature of offenses has also gone changes. An adequate criminal investigation is the foundation of any criminal case. It's a journey towards finding the truth. Technology can obviously play a pivotal role in bringing a culprit to book. In a criminal investigation, surveillance can be used over different categories of individuals. It may be over a common man, a suspect, an accused, or even the perpetrator himself. The primary purpose of a criminal investigation is to identify and bring a perpetrator to book. The difficulty arises when the use of surveillance stretches beyond what is required. Surveillance cannot be employed against each and every category of person which we discussed earlier in the same manner. Phone tapping, interception of email, determination of GPS location or some of the few examples in which surveillance can be affected. Phone tapping and determination of location have become easier and more sophisticated, especially when every citizen carries at least one mobile phone with him. To trace an alleged fugitive on the run in the movie Enemy of the State, which is obviously a popular movie, which hit the theaters in the year 1998, the agencies employed voice recognition technology on a call which the said fugitive made from a public phone booth in a different state within the United States. Satellite technology was also used to look, locate that public phone along with the usage of CCTV cameras. Uh, this was the portrayal 25 years ago. In, the, in yet another movie, Zero Dark Thirty, which chronicles the hunt of Obama Bill Laden, one character, which is an official of the Central Intelligence Agency, frustrated with the inability to positively identify him in his hideout, asks, can we just get him on the phone. This phrase is very telling. It demonstrates that the states have the capacity to catalog millions of calls and from them individually identify each and every individual person. We have reached a stage where every moment of an individual becomes vulnerable to surveillance to every electronic gadget which we could possibly foresee. Every intimate conversation has become capable of being recorded. The movements of a suspect are not only monitored, but also closely watched. Spywares of different specifications with the origins of unimaginable variety have come into their existence. In India's context, the challenge becomes even more complex when we take note of three facts. First, India is to state, say, said to take over 
China as the most, most, most populous country. Second, India is also one of the most world's biggest markets for smartphones. And number three, the personal data generated or fed into the systems would be accessible to, to the multi, multinational corporations. This in itself is bound to raise complicated issues relating to privacy protection. However, it's also true that while dealing with white collar crimes, in particular, phones, laptops, and tablets become crucial sources of evidence. Crimes are increasingly committed through the usage of technology. And therefore, the, it, it has to be used to, to resolve. In the year 2013, a teenager in Germany named Max Skimit used the internet to establish a flourishing multi-million drug business through his ingenuity. He employed the internet to tap the postal system, the traditional way of sending messages, to ship drugs to his customers, even at their doorsteps. He was operating through the internet and therefore could not be seen physically. Indeed, terrorism and ter drug related offenses have become highly sophisticated by the use of technology. WhatsApp and emails being mediums of exchange and communication would facilitate if we have an adequate facet of investigation to nail the culprit. Take for example, recently, a murder of a woman got recorded on the CCTV camera, making the investigation more concrete and easier. The introduction of artificial intelligence and machine learning has got its own positive and negatives. An individual's behavioral pattern can be mapped and their future actions could very well be visualized. Invasion of privacy would certainly happen when surveillance is adopted in the investigation of a crime. However, an element of moderation by applying the doctrine of proportionality is expected to be followed in a fair investigation. Commenting upon the ground reality of increasing surveillance, this quote in Putasami has cautioned, we are in an informative information age with the growth and development of technology, more information is now easily accessible. The information explosion has manifold advantages, but also some disadvantages. The access to information, which an individual may not want to give, needs the protection of privacy. The right to privacy is, is claimed for the state and non-state actors. The recognition and enforcement of claims by non-state actors may require legislative intervention by the state. Having come to, come to this, this conclusion, 
and acknowledging the existence of surveillance and its extensive use in future, the need of the hour, we should take note of the voice and concern expressed in Puttasan. The challenges are no doubt huge and ever evolving, but there must be a constant endeavor to uphold this precious concept of liberty, namely privacy, by appropriately using the significant tool, which, by, which we mean the doctrine of proportionality. Given the factual position that the usage and the development of technology can never be stopped being an instrument of progress, it must not be allowed in the hands of unwanted elements. A clear demarcation is needed by drawing a Lashman Rekha while involving in a criminal investigation. As noted in Puttasami, one cannot possibly visualize and oversee all future problems. Any action facilitating a state machinery must be backed by the authority of law. For doing so, it would only be appropriate for that there must be a codified law, a law which empowers an investigation agency to undertake an act of surveillance. Needless to say, such a law must be subject to the constitutional mandate with specific reference to part three of the constitution. That this would prevent any arbitrary action while preserving the privacy of an individual. When we provide for a law, the implementation and monitoring agencies must consist of high dignitaries. As fact, a fact promptly taken note of by this court in PUCL versus Union of India, way back in the year 1997. The court further went on to hold that there is a pressing need to have proper and adequate safeguards. A series of directions were issued which are being followed and given effect to to date. However, it would only be appropriate that such actions should come out, come out of a statutory framework. Such directions were issued by, this, by the Supreme Court only by taking note of the absence of an adequate statute. While dealing with the doctrine of proportionality, it has to be inbuilt in the statute itself. Therefore, the concept of proportionality has to be seen both from the action, the, the statute, and the power to be exercised by the investigation agency. This is for the reason that both the enactment and the action are and, in, and would constitute a curtailment of privacy, a facet of liberty. The statute should therefore reflect the objective behind it and the manner in which an investigation agency is expected to exercise. 
if there is an alternative available that is equally effective, then an attempt to encroach upon one's own privacy is better be eschewed. Thus, the concept of proportionality is indeed the core factor when it comes to the intrusion of one's own privacy. While a statute should apply the doctrine, its implementation lies with the legislature, executive, and judiciary equally. It should start with the introduction of a law with adequate safeguards. Fortunately, our courts have already begun to grapple with the issues with, with alacrity and erudition. For instance, the Delhi High Court has observed in Jatinder Paul Singh versus CB, CBI, if the directions of the Appress Court in PUCL's case, which are now re-enforced and approved by the Appress Court, in KT Putasami as also the mandatory rules in regard to the illegal, illegally intercepted messages pursuant to an order having no sanction of law or permitted to be floated, we may be breeding contempt for law that to in matters involving infraction of fundamental right of privacy under Article 21 of the Constitution of India. To declare that because the fundamental rights in the administration of criminal law, the ends would justify the means would amount to declaring the government authorities may violate any directions of the Supreme Court or mandatory statutory rules in order to secure evidence against citizens. It would lead to manifest arbitrariness and would promote the scant regard to the procedure and fundamental rights of the citizen and law laid on by the Apex Court. I must compliment the author of the judgment for having understood the concept of privacy and the need for the restrictions. The judgment of the Apex Court in both Puttasami 1 and 2 have become somewhat of a guiding light for the preparation of the data, data protection framework in India, wherein various safeguards for the protection of privacy and restraints on self incrimination have been envisaged. Courts will have their task cut out in recognizing and drawing the contours which could act as a Lashman Rekha. What is relevant is a duty of the court to uphold privacy while facilitating a proper criminal investigation. Court has to do a balancing act in undertaking the SID exercise. Considering the enormity of the task before us, in conclusion, I would say that the duty to preserve privacy as a cherished right is enjoined by the Constitution on all three pillars of democracy, meant to be given effect through the prism of proportionality, which would go a very long way in the efforts in our national building. The task is very complex, but it is interesting to note that it would continue to haunt the courts at various levels very frequently in the coming years. Thank you very much for giving, the, giving this opportunity to express my views.
I extend my thanks, heartfelt thanks and gratitude to Honorable Mr. Justice M.M. Sundaresh for sharing his erudite insights on the topic for today's discussion. While Justice Sundaresh has covered the topic comprehensively, I will, I will be touching upon a few broad contours. And before that, I will quickly introduce myself. Uh, very good morning to everyone, uh, the esteemed speakers and panelists, colleagues and members of the foundation, and all the viewers. I'm advocate Divyanshu Shirvastav, an alumnus of Gujarat National Law University, Gandhinagar, and advocate or record with the Supreme Court. Now, the topic for, the to for today's discussion is extremely relevant. As today, the threat to privacy in surveillance is at its peak today, owing to advancement in technology and internet like it was never before. Surveillance can be done in various forms. It could be either through phone tapping, or interception of email or determination of GPS location or monitoring one's internet activity using spyware. Surveillance was put to extensive use in the French Revolution and also in the two world wars that we had. Surveillance also finds mention or rather has confirmed usage in various historical texts like Rig Veda, Manuspriti and Kautilya's Arthashastra. So from the very beginning of the civilization itself to the present times, the state has been using one or another form of surveillance, sometimes for genuine purposes and sometimes for not so genuine reasons. Whatever may be the motivation, the risk of breach of privacy or violation of the Lakshman Rekha looms large in any activity of surveillance. Perhaps this is the reason why surveillance is often termed as a necessary evil. It is necessary for collection of evidence or for ensuring the, ensuring the effectiveness of trial. It is required as not every crime is committed in broad daylight and great number of crimes are hatched in secrecy. For example, white collar crimes. It is termed an evil as the risk of breach of privacy and, associ and associated fundamental rights is concomitant with surveillance, especially in societies or culture where the superstructure is still at a nascent stage or evolving. While surveillance in criminal investigation has been used from times immemorial, both in this country as well as in foreign jurisdictions, the concerns for privacy has received the warranted impetus only now. Emphasizing the, the virtue of privacy, it has been so held in case Putta Swami case, and I quote, to live is to live with dignity. The draftsmen of the constitution define their vision for, of the society in which constitutional values would be attained by emphasizing, among other freedoms, liberty and dignity. So fundamental is dignity that it permeates the core of the rights guaranteed to the individual by part three. And I end quote. Moving ahead, the need of the hour is to strike a balance between the two competing rights. That is the right or duty of the state to use surveillance and the right of privacy of the accused or the associated persons. Choosing one over another is fraught with problems or risks, and therefore both are required in societal interest. An equilibrium of both the factors or interests is a desideratum. This is where the role of constitutional courts come in, and this is where the test of proportionality comes in. The test of proportionality serves as a guiding light or the bridge between these two contesting factors. The doctrine of proportionality with little or no variation exists in other jurisdictions as well, like the United States, the United Kingdom, and the European Union. It has an acceptance and recognition world over, and also finds its mention in the conventions of the United Nations as well. Post the Put Putta Swami judgment, there has been shift in the position of courts insofar as the admissibility of the evidence obtained in violation of privacy is, is concerned. To conclude, I would say that the un undercurrents of the topic today are in complete consonance with the salutary, salutary principles laid down by Justice H. R. Khanna in his famous dissent in Habeas Corpus case. Now, before proceeding with the rest of the session, I would request the technical team to play a short video on the CAN Foundation.
good afternoon everyone my name is abhikal pratap singh and i am an advocate on record at the supreme court of india i am here to introduce our next speaker of the session mr guru krishna kumar who is a senior counsel practicing at the supreme court sir graduated with a degree in law from the university of madras while in college he was an active debater winning prestigious debates at the state and national level he also represented india in the renowned philip c jessup international moot court competition in washington dc and finished in the top 8 teams of the world after his graduation sir was selected by the british foreign and commonwealth office under the british shevening scholarship program for pursuing a course in commercial and corporate law in the united kingdom this program involved an academic phase as well as practical phase where he worked in a law firm and barristers chambers in london sir began his career as a legal resource in larsen and tubro limited one of india's leading corporate houses thereafter he resigned from the assignment and after a brief stint to take up full time litigation work initially in, in madras high court and thereafter moving his practice to the supreme court of india in supreme court of india sir served as additional advocate general of tamil nadu and in 2012 he was designated as a senior advocate by the honorable supreme court sir has extensive experience of over 3 decades now in handling disputes and appearing in important cases in varied fields of law ranging from constitutional law commercial and corporate laws including ipr arbitration law insolvency and bankruptcy law and also election disputes he has appeared in many important political matters and he has also appeared pro bono in cases involving issues of significant social importance his work experience outside india includes appearing in international commercial arbitrations participating in proceedings in the uk in cases pertaining to issues involving private international law and providing expert assistance on indian law he has also participated in seminars and conferences at the national and international level and had, and has presented papers on various legal issues of topical importance i now request sir to share his thoughts on today's topic my humble greetings to this uh, distinguished gathering consisting of uh, my lord justice sundresh my co-panelist and good friend mr sham devan professor surya prakash the organizers of the foundation and today's function siddharth gupta Sank sankal kochar abikal and all the other participants as also the viewers who i understand include the president of the cba the chairman of the bar council of india the president of scora and all the other friends friends while it is a privilege to have heard and follow the erudite and comprehensive presentation by my lord justice sundresh that presents a difficulty for me in the sense that the canvas that has been covered by his lord chief justice sundresh is so wide and i am really one left wondering as to what really i can project meaningfully without repeating some of the ideas nevertheless i shall endeavor to flag certain important issues on the subject and when i want to start talking about the subject or rather embark on this journey i am reminded of this apocryphal journey which is supposed to have happened in an airplane journey where the captain made an announcement that it was a very happy occasion to note that the speed that the aircraft had achieved was so great because of technological advancement that we were going to achieve the speed of sound or even go beyond so there was instant rejoicing amongst the passengers because that reflected the extent of technological advancement which had been made by human kind but within seconds there was a more somber and in fact a bit of a problematic mood which was brought in and some kind of apprehension which came in because the captain in the same breath also said but unfortunately i do not know what is the direction in which we are going friends i think this really represents the irony of the present generation and what times we are living in we are talking of major technological advancements 
we are talking of major strides in science and technology in fact today artificial intelligence is being spoken of as the next major step in human development and evolution in fact we now have generative artificial intelligence we have super intelligent ai while all this is there on one hand yesterday i came across an article in one of the leading newspapers that the makers of chat gpt are now apprehensive that there could be super intelligent ai which can turn rogue and there is absolutely nothing to control all of that so they are now dedicating all their knowledge to develop some kind of technology to counterbalance this now this is the kind of extraordinary development of technology that we are living in today we are talking of encrypted messages we are talk talking of phone tapping we are talking of wire tapping we are talking of metadata data mining we are talking of so many other allied aspects now one might wonder why is it that i'm talking about all of this now what is the relevance of this for today's topic obviously it has this direct relevance namely all these are technological tools which are available to the state and these are available to the state for monitoring and doing surveillance over citizens now this is the reason why i say technological development on one hand is fantastic but at the same time the potential it has to infringe upon privacy and personal liberty of the individual citizen is mind boggling and i think this really sets the context for consideration of the topic today now one might ask this question in fact this was touched upon by my lord justice sundaresh and the previous speaker what is wrong in the state doing some kind of surveillance at the end of the day prevention of crime prevention of terrorist activities ensuring that law and order is maintained are all legitimate state interests they are all necessary for maintaining public order they are all necessary in larger public interest so what is it that really wrong about it in fact talking of historical historical perspective in this regard i remember just sundaresh talking about what is mentioned in arthashastra of kautilya in fact when i heard that i was reminded of this very interesting article which i read a little while ago in the harvard law journal the title for the topic is very interestingly liberty to spy there the author is talking about the historical perspective in the context of western philosophers there he refers to immanuel kant's metaphysics of morals where how kant says that it is wrong for a ruler to engage in spying or intelligence or other such activities and that really becomes the inspiration for advocates of liberty to say that the state should not engage in all of this he also refers to the approach adopted by philosophers like hobbes who said that intelligence is one of the core responsibilities of a ruler and if he doesn't do that he will be abrogating the core responsibility that he has in fact he says hobbes is following the machiavellian principle that a ruler is duty bound to keep thinking about war all the time more so in peace time than in war time so therefore historically the fact that some kind of surveillance takes place has always had its justifications it has not been without its problems it has its own compelling reasons but at the same time the question would arise is it something which is unbridled is it something which the law permits or how much of it does the law permit what is the law on that today when we talk of the law at this point of time we immediately look at the celebrated decision in putta swami by the nine judges and the subsequent one of course my friend mr divan was integrally involved in both those matters and made some very persuasive submissions but before putta swami i thought i'll just take a small little peep into the past leaving aside mp sharma and certain other cases which have now been set aside and are really of historical value today i thought i'll just have one very very brief look at pucl case of 
because I think that involved a square challenge to phone tapping and the provisions of the Telegraph Act. Now, how did the court deal with the challenge? The court in the first place specifically said that privacy is part of fundamental right. Though, of course, it would not trace it to any specific individual right in terms of a standalone right. But the court did recognize it. And importantly, for our present purposes today, it adopted the just fair reasonable paradigm to say that any phone tapping must satisfy the requirements of having to be just fair and reasonable. Having found that the statute was inadequate, the court laid down various guidelines. Now, these guidelines, of course, today, as, as a matter of historical information, are incorporated in the Telegraph rules themselves. Most of it is found, if I remember right, in Rule 419A of the Telegraph Act rules. And to that extent, this decision in PUCL, in my humble opinion, is some kind of a beginning point to look at where the law stands on giving effect to right to privacy, acknowledging and recognizing it judicially, and to impose fetters. In fact, this sets the tone to look at the topic itself today. Has the law laid down by the Supreme Court have the constitutional provisions helped in bringing about some kind of a Lakshman Rekha or a line? Or on the contrary, they are really a dividing line or have only exacerbated some kind of a precipitation of conflicting lines between individual privacy claims and the claims of the state for surveillance to ensure larger public interest. Now, having spoken about PUCL, I think a very brief reference to Puttaswamy, Justice Sundaresh has made very elaborate reference to uh, Puttaswamy's case. I'll only very briefly refer to it for this reason. Apart from specifically recognizing right to privacy and citing it squarely in Article 21, the standard laid down in Puttaswamy is, I think, something very important to discuss. The three criteria which were laid down in Justice Chandrachud's uh, decision, requirement one being that there must be a law to back, back up any kind of incursion into individual rights. The need to have legitimacy or justification for that, that is to say, there is some larger public purpose or object which is sought to be achieved by the incursion which is sought to be done. And importantly, the nature of the measure which has been taken consistent with the object, whether it is proportionate or disproportionate with the object that is sought to be achieved. This is probably the most straightforward and simplistic way of putting the tests which have been laid down. For Justice Cowell also has paraphrased this standard with one additional factor, namely, the need for procedural safeguards in respect of whatever be the measures. Now, another case that I wanted to mention about, having spoken very, very briefly about Puttaswamy's case, is I think the Puttaswamy's two case, which really involved application of the standards laid down in Puttaswamy 1. Of course, everybody recalls the background to both the decisions, which I don't want to recapitulate for, uh, for saving time. In Puttaswamy 2, where, where the validity of Aadhaar was gone into, the court had occasion to apply the law laid down in Puttaswamy 1. Now, the majority, while substantially upholding the validity of the act, set aside and quashed two provisions. I think that's a little important for our present purposes today. One is section 33.2. The other is section 57. And talking of section 33.2, the majority spoke about how 33.2, which envisages sharing of information in national interest that can take place on the basis of orders which may be passed by a particular officer named in the provision. The court said 
that provision is something which cannot stand scrutiny for the simple reason that the power the drastic power of divulging and sharing information is something which is vested in an officer who is not a high ranking officer having said that the court also said it is necessary that such a power is invested in a high ranking authority not only that what is really important for our present purposes today the court went on to say to say that it is desirable that any such decision taken by a high ranking officer is subject to some kind of judicial scrutiny preferably by a high court judge now i think this throws very significant light on what we are looking at by way of testing the validity of the surveillance regime in this country today of course the court while applying the principle of proportionality in looking at the provisions of the act did its own small little modulation or modification or explanation of the proportionality standard laid down in putasamy 1 and came out with its own formulation of the principle and held the provisions to be substantially valid in law now turning back to section 33 discussion and the reasoning of the court i think that gives us some kind of an idea of what really are the problem areas we are looking at in respect of the surveillance regime now this surveillance regime what we are looking at today what are really the provisions that we have what what is the extant law today the first requirement of a law being there is of course satisfied we have apart from the constitutional provisions article 19 21 14 etc we have the provisions of the telegraph act section 5 particularly and of course the information technology act so the first of the troika of considerations namely a law stands satisfied the second question is what is it that is the legitimate object that is thought to be achieved by any kind of surveillance that can take place there again you find provisions where qualifications are set out in these statutes to ensure that on the happening of certain contingencies or for achieving certain objects or for certain specified purposes surveillance can take place now to that extent without going into the nitty gritty of those expressions used in these statutes or the exact meaning to be ascribed to all of them one can safely proceed on the basis that some kind of standard has been laid down of course the question may still arise whether those expressions themselves are vague are they subject or susceptible to varied interpretations or expressions or misuse or abuse but keeping that aside for a minute the question comes whether any measure taken in exercise of those rights is proportional now the issue that one would consider by looking at this core and central and important issue is this whom is the power vested in the power is vested in an officer belonging to the executive there is provision for some kind of a review by a review committee the review committee again consists of persons drawn from the executive branch so question would arise whether this is really like some kind of a regime which is from caesar to caesar whether it is sufficient that there is only executive decision making and executive prerogative and right to decide that a subject would be put through surveillance whether a decision taken for surveillance is sufficiently justified or constitutionally justified if it is going to be exclusively and, and entirely in the hands of the executive one would think that this is obviously not so there needs to be some kind of judicial oversight now having said that a problem may still arise a question may still arise does not a situation of certain emergency or certain importance demand immediate action or does not the nature of the subject or the person or the type of activity of the person which is who is sought to be surveilled upon or spied upon or really subjected to intrusion in terms of monitoring or tracking his activities is it such that it cannot brook any kind of 
judicial intervention because that may result in the measure itself or the action itself being rendered ineffective. I would think on a balance of the scale, it would be necessary that some kind of a regime is in place which ensures that some kind of pre-scrutiny takes place. In fact, I recall some Irish writers talking about how there, could, there should be or there ought to be ex ante judicial oversight of any decision to do surveillance. Of course, there is discussion of ex post judicial oversight of surveillance decisions. But the difficulty is in the absence of any kind of judicial oversight, I would be compelled to think that it may not stand the scrutiny of proportionality. Now, having said that, I want to look at another live example of where the question of surveillance really is being tested in courts. That's the Pegasus case. Now, before talking about Pegasus, I must point out to you also how there is today a square challenge pending in the Supreme Court to the existing statutory regime, where various grounds have been taken, particularly because of the decision in Putasami 1 and saying that after PUCL, Putasami having cited specifically right to privacy in Article 21, there needs to be a look at the validity of the existing surveillance regime. Now, coming back to Pegasus that I was talking about, Pegasus, of course, all of us recall, really came up as some kind of a bolt from the blue, where information came about that some kind of malware, spyware has been developed, which, which really has been unleashed on various citizens belonging to various walks of life, including constitutional authorities, to spy on them, spy on their activities, collect information, etc. And more importantly, that it has been utilized by the state agencies for spying on subjects. Now, one, one important facet of the Pegasus controversy and the Pegasus episode is that that really is dealing with bulk surveillance. We are looking at class of subjects or group of subjects in contrast to what the existing regime envisages, which talks about individuals being looked at for their activities or being monitored for their activities for specific legitimate purposes, including for crime detection and crime prevention. Now, the matter comes before Supreme Court and the stand of the state, if I may say so, was equivocal. The state, amongst various other things, took the justification of national security to justify non-diverging of information on what exactly is the stand of the state, whether in fact such uh, spyware has been utilized, if so, what kind of utilization has taken place, and that compelled the court to issue directions. The court there referred to various aspects of the right to privacy and the need to have some kind of check on unjustified surveillance of citizens and decided to constitute a committee. And importantly, that committee of technical experts would be overseen by a retired judge, namely a judicial mind, was to look at what really has exactly happened. Of course, the matter is pending at large. Now, therefore, we are today in a situation where there is a surveillance regime which really does not have any kind of judicial oversight or judicial scrutiny. Now, this is one major aspect which may re require reflection upon where to really contextualize the discussion. Is there some kind of Lakshman Rekha which needs to be drawn? Is there some kind of limit which has to be placed on the exercise of power by the state in exercise of powers in the surveillance, existing surveillance regime? No, the issue doesn't end there. We have today also, because of technological advancements, so much of collection of data. I spoke about metadata. The previous speaker spoke about, mentioned about metadata, data mining, etc. Now, that's all being utilized by various agencies. They are all being collected by various agencies. 
No, in fact, in the process of looking at integrity of data, which is collected by various agencies, including states, Putasami one, one would recall, spoke about the need for a robust data protection regime. Today, as we are discussing the subject, we have the bill after going through various stages, various discussions, finally a bill for data protection, which is now in place and is reported to be placed before the, or to be placed before the parliament. Now, what does that bill really provide for? It does provide for some kind of protection of data which is collected. To that extent, it is fine. There, there is a duty cast on agencies which collect data to maintain the integrity of the data. But the matter doesn't end there. The problem is, the draft bill envisages that this kind of protection of data or the application of this law will not apply to state or instrumentalities as may be notified, which means we go back to the basic point that the state would be able to collect data and use it in the manner it seeks to do. So that raises very, very significant questions and pertinent questions on the validity and the constitutionality of the regime that we are looking at. In fact, data protection is one aspect of the right to privacy or the correctness of the law that may intrude into privacy noted in Patasamai 1. Justice Call, if I recall, of the three standards, you also added to it the standard of procedural safeguard. So we still have an open avenue an area where data protection is something which requires a serious look in terms of its validity and tenability. Now, there is one other allied problem that we have in respect of usage of data. Talking of surveillance and the need of it for criminal investigation, where the nature of crimes today have become so advanced, cyber crimes today are a veritable threat to humankind itself. Now, data which is collected, can it not be said that data which is collected from however infirm, constitutionally infirm a regime may be, it is still legitimate and necessary for detecting and preventing crime and to punish crime? The question will be, is it justification enough to say that even a faulty surveillance regime can still result in data being collected and being used for criminal law purposes. This, I think, is again a significant area where the Lakshman Rekha will have to be drawn. We need to look at the existing standard for collection of evidence in criminal proceedings. In India, as everybody knows, it's rather well settled that even evidence which is collected illegally can still be looked into if it is relevant. Relevancy has been taken to be the paradigm for usage of evidence, however illegal the collection may have been. Now, I think that is something which is extremely significant to consider for the simple reason that in the light of the express enunciation of the right to privacy by the constitution bench, there needs to be a serious look or rather a relook at this existing approach to collection of evidence and usage of evidence in criminal proceedings. In fact, one would think, given the express declaration of the right to privacy by the constitution bench, perhaps an affected individual may consider moving the higher judiciary, maybe the high court under 226, or a 32 petition, better still, where he says there is a violation of fundamental rights because the regime on which I am being spied upon or my activities are being monitored is something which is based on a regime which is not constitutionally valid and even the evidence collected or the material collected based on that is something which is illegal and perhaps seek declarations, return of data or even further a direction that such data cannot be used in criminal proceedings if they were to be used. Friends, I would think these are some of the important aspects which would require reflection, consideration. Given the paucity of time, 
I thought I will flag these important issues and leave the debate for your consideration in a larger forum and for your reflection and hope that this helps us in having a better view of where we stand in respect of the surveillance regime and the right to privacy. And hopefully the lines will be drawn, which ensure that we have a proper balance of the right to privacy and at the same time to ensure that the larger public purpose of crime detection and prevention is taken care of so that legitimate public interest can be given effect to. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate in this symposium today. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your thoughts with us. It wouldn't be wrong to say that with your vast experience and service to the bar over the years, you are an institution in yourself. I'm sure everyone who attended today will take away a lot from your wise words, especially the younger ones who are inspired by your journey. We look up to you, sir. Thank you so much. Now I request Mr. Tariq Khan to take it from here. Thank you, Abhikal. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Tariq Khan, the Registrar of International Arbitration and Mediation Center, Hyderabad. Today, I have the privilege to introduce to you Mr. Shyam Divan, a distinguished senior advocate of the Supreme Court of India. With a career spanning over several decades, Mr. Divan has established himself as a prominent figure in the field of constitutional law and civil litigation, specializing in areas such as banking, securities law, arbitration, administrative law, and environment law. Throughout his illustrious career, Mr. Divan has been involved in a landmark, uh, in various landmark constitutional cases that have shaped India's legal landscape. He has also appeared before the Supreme Court in various significant cases, such as the Declaration of Privacy as a Fundamental Right in Justice K. S. Puttaswamy versus Union of India case, and also the decriminalization of homosexuality in the Navtej Singh Johar versus Union of India case, and also the challenge to the Aadhaar Biometric Program in Justice uh, K. S. Puttaswamy II versus Union of India. Sir's expertise and contributions have extended to diverse areas of law, including public interest litigation, civil liberties, biometrics, privacy, and the constitution. Mr. Divan is also the co-author of Environment Law and Policy in India, and has also been a mentor to Can Foundation. Sir has also been an inspiration for young lawyers like us and it's always a delight to see Sir argue in court cases. Without wasting much time, I would like to request Sir to kindly enlighten us with his address. Over to you, Sir. Thank you very Thank much, you. Tariq. Um, Justice Sundaresh, uh, Professor S. Surya Prakash, my dear friend, Guru Krishna Kumar, students, young advocates, supporters of Can Foundation, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Uh, I'm honored to participate in the third uh, Justice HR Khanna Memorial National Symposium. Thank you very, very much for having me. Uh, I join the distinguished co-panelists in complimenting the organizers of this event, not just for preserving the memory of a great judge, but also for choosing a theme of enormous contemporary relevance. Our theme this afternoon, uh, the Lakshman Rekha between surveillance and privacy, is at the very core of protecting freedom and an open society. These are values that were very dear to Justice H.R. Khanna. Let me open with a short tribute to the memory of the judge in whose honor we deliberate today. I had the privilege of meeting Justice H.R. Khanna briefly in 2002. There was a celebration to mark the happy milestone of my late father completing 50 years at the bar. And I recall distinctly how pleased my father was to have Justice H.R. Khanna in the front, uh, front row uh, and how keen he was to make the introduction, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it made my day when I received a handshake, a pat on the shoulder, and a few words of encouragement from that great judge. Justice Khanna personified courage, integrity, and a keen sense of balance. As we know, most cases that crowd the docket of the Supreme Court decide themselves usually by a pair of keen judicial minds. Occasionally with the so-called assistance that my colleague Guru Krishna Kumar and I pretend to render. And then there are those few rare cases that require courage to decide correctly. 
the notorious adm jabalpur judgment now overruled in puttaswami was one such we salute the memory of justice h r khanna for his ringing dissent in adm jabalpur we salute him for keeping alive the hope of liberty for keeping the flame of liberty during dark and trying times burning and then there's that other quality of a great judge striking a fair and correct balance amongst competing interests in the cause of justice here we have a singular example of the fundamental rights case the great balancing act and the test devised by justice kanna that we popularly known as known now as the basic structure doctrine is a jurisprudential gift to young democracies and infant republics struggling to nurture a fair and inclusive society where individuals can flourish on a raft of human rights on 24th november 2023 we marked 50 years of the keshavanand bharti judgment a remarkable milestone and a testament to the enduring wisdom of the fine balance struck by justice h r khanna as nani palkiwala the lead counsel for the petitioners in keshavanand bharti wrote thus six judges decided the case in favor of the citizen and six in favor of the state justice h r khanna agreed fully with none of these 12 judges and decided the case midway between the two conflicting viewpoints palkiwala writes thus by a strange quirk of fate the judgment of justice khanna which was none of with uh, with which none of the other 12 judges totally agreed has become the law of the land end of quote to mark a century of keshana keshavanan a uh, half a century of keshavananda bharti there's a podcast under preparation and i requested one of the researchers to share her notes on an interview with justice hr khanna's son rajiv khanna when asked where did justice khanna get his inner moral strength this was the reply which rajiv khanna gave and i quote and i think we have to go back to the roots that he belongs to his father was a leading lawyer in amritsar and was very active and also in the amritsar municipal corporation and i quote you one incident soon after the jallianwala bag uh, incident uh, the viceroy decided to visit amritsar and obviously the britishers were keen that the amritsar municipal corporation gives them a unanimous welcome now there were 30 members of the amritsar municipal corporation 29 agreed to give him a welcome my grandfather as just as hr karna's father refused to do so and continued to object to the welcome because of the jallianwala bag incident and he refused to participate in any function where the viceroy did this so this is where i think that it was his upbringing which led to this sort of the two which led to the sort of principle stands that he took on the aspect of the middle path which justice Kesh, uh, uh, in keshavananda bharti which was adopted uh, rajiv khanna recalled he used to also say in the keshavananda bharti case uh that what that moderates have a great role and that they were the lubricants in a society and therefore very often he would try to find a middle path armed with these values of courage and the virtue of the middle path let me share a few thoughts on surveillance and privacy to supplement the reflections of justice sundaresh and my friend guru let me lay my cards on the table this is of course in the context of what the scholar shoshana zuboff describes as the age of surveillance capitalism or what the privacy scholar julie cohen calls informational capitalism in my view if we are to preserve an open society and forge a nation that is inclusive and that respects individual rights there are at least four cardinal factors that must inform the judicial process first we will need to devise legal principles for a surveillance society these principles must align to the middle path 
and have durability. Remember the utility of the basic structure doctrine. These middle path principles will have to balance privacy interests of individuals and businesses against not just the traditional antagonist, which is the state, and which Justice Sundaresh and uh, uh, Mr. Guru Krishna Kumar spoke about. But the balancing will also have to be against commercial interests of big technology and other private actors. So that's my first point. Second, there will be situations and times when the middle path is not an option, when liberty is in peril, and our courts must then stand up and be counted just as Justice Khanna did in ADM Jabalpur. Some of you have uh, may have visited the beautiful tea estate in the Darjeeling district named Rangli Ranglio. The version of that name which was shared with me was that a Buddhist monk used the expression, he intoned Rangli Rangliot to stop the floodwaters that were rising. And it means this far and no further. Our courts will have to summon the courage periodically, doubtless after understanding the impact and implications of surveillance technologies, to tell the state and to tell technology companies Rangli Rangliot or this far and no further. The third point I wish to mention is that freedom is fragile. It diminishes and disappears rapidly, as we see in jurisdictions such as Hong Kong, where despite a strong rule of law record, the past three years have seen a severe erosion of civil and political freedoms. The final or the fourth point I wish to make is that our constitution is premised on peaceful contestations and a healthy distrust of state power. If we overtrust the state in the judicial process and generally, we are likely to be condemned to suffer a constriction of freedom and liberty. Let me share a technology or surveillance issue which arose overseas. It's also, you know, a fairly safe kind of uh, passage to talk about overseas examples when we have a distinguished sitting judge on the panel. So I'll give you an example which is rather distant. And I draw much of my information from a podcast which was, uh, which was on uh, the Radio Lab platform, and it was called Eye in the Sky. And very briefly, the podcast begins with this technology which was deployed, and it started during the Iraq war, where the, uh, the U.S. Army was finding that there were a huge number of these improvised devices which were going off, resulting in so many deaths and casualties. And they were around, and some of you will remember, the Ira Iraqi city of Fallujah. Now, the technology solution which was deployed was they put up a plane which had a camera, and the camera kept photographing the city right from above at, you know, very, very short intervals. Now, what this, now what, whenever a bomb thereafter went off, they would play, they would locate the explosion, and they would go back in time, one second back, two seconds back, three seconds back, place it back, and virtually travel back in time with those images and see and track down as to exactly how this particular happened. This, this device which was used during war was so successful that it resulted in a tipping point in finding out as to who the persons were behind these bomb explosions. And they were, the U.S. Army was able to, and the forces were able, and the uh, forces allied to the U.S. Army were able to um, uh, pluck this or defeat this menace. Then, of course, if once that you have a defense technology, it comes to be deployed uh, in the private sector and in private spaces. And it was attempted to be sold and, in fact, was deployed in a Mexican city of Juarez. And in that particular city, Juarez, Mexico, there was a huge cartel in operation. There was a police officer who was assassinated. And they worked it out backwards to see how the cars, etc., which planted this, 
which were the cars meeting and using this particular technology, they were able to track down and find out the exact hub from which this particular location and location where the uh, crime syndicate was operating and they were able to disrupt that particular crime syndicate. Now see what happened in the United States thereafter. There were certain American cities which also sought to deploy this. But the American 14th Constitutional Amendment right, which you know is no deprivation of life or liberty or property without due process of law, was employed to strike down the program and the evidence which was collected pursuant to these means, because this kind of or type of surveillance was so invasive and not authorized by law, etc. So the technology is there. Many will argue that what's wrong with it, because it's being deployed to fight, you know, uh, sources of uh, uh, forces which are inimical to the state. What's wrong with this? And here I want to just make and flag a, sing uh, a point very quickly that you will often find as advocates and young lawyers and law students will be practicing shortly that the benefits of surveillance and technologies that employ surveillance are often tangible. They are often very evident. But what we lose and the enormous cost is often very diffused. And it's very difficult to grasp what those particular elements and aspects are. And this makes fighting a case before any of our constitutional courts and fighting surveillance issues and incursions on liberty and privacy, privacy actually, a very difficult task because it involves a special learning on the part of counsel because the clients may know it. It's very difficult first to understand what these real issues are. After that, after you educate yourself, one has to educate the court, which often is a very, very challenging process because our courts are also you know, under tremendous pressure of time and resources. So that's another special challenge to these type of privacy cases because the government is usually, or the state, or not just the state as I mentioned, it's also the technology companies are showing you that, oh, this is the benefit. How can you deny or how can you deny this a particular benefit to society? And uh, I want to just therefore mention, uh, I, I pick up on the point which uh, uh, Justice Sundresh mentioned with regard to the CCTV cameras being deployed. And here again, while uh, the, you know, the survey by Forbes indicates that some of our cities are following the CCTV camera density, the most surveilled in the world. The question then is, what are we losing by this? And let me take a slightly different example, I mean, on the same theme and mention it to you. And it's really for your reflection and for your consideration as we move, as you move forward and reflect on it. What is your view on CCTV cameras in classrooms? Let's take that. And in corridors, say, in schools. And uh, the tangible benefit which is being projected by school by not so much school administrations, but by governments, is that, oh, this is such a wonderful thing because it prevents bullying. It's such a wonderful thing because it uh, ensures that teachers are actually teaching. It helps us spot students who are, uh, you know, whatever, uh, 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 distracting others, who are uh, uh, reflecting or who are daydreaming and whatever else you might have. Now just please don't uh, let, I mean, you're, everyone is entitled to uh, immediate answer in the blink of an eye, but reflect on it. Think about the importance of childhood. Think about the importance of the freedoms that we enjoy and that the freedoms we hope to enjoy. Do we want to really become a regimented society? Do we want to become a society where you will have all sorts of reports and surveilling uh, uh, right from your classroom and without, because many of the smart devices which we are using, unbeknownst to us, are transmitting huge amounts of information back to the technology companies. And uh, since Justice Sundaresh uh, mentioned a film or two, I'll also mention the Truman Show, which was you know a very troubling film, at least to me, because that film had uh, uh, that recording of uh, a child right from the moment you know he is born and he's on live television and someone is making profits of it 
and the person who's the subject of the film is not even aware of uh, I, i think it was a jim carrey uh, film is not even aware of what is happening so these are the huge wages of uh, uh, or the cost which we have to pay if we succumb to a surveillance society i just want to mention uh, an element was made to put a uh, reference was made to putaswami 2 and on biometrics and uh, professor surya prakash also mentioned it in the context of a student asking him at an earlier session that so what's wrong with hang- handing over biometrics so let me just share an interesting an interesting issue one of the points which i mean i thought uh, we will not require too much of an effort to persuade the supreme court but we failed on it i thought at least before the supreme court judgment came that the biometrics and that my fingerprints were mine that was the impression i was under and i said that you know the argument was that look if these fingerprints are mine uh, i must have custody, custody control and dominion over them my iris uh, scan is mine and it cannot be taken away uh, by the government of india and if it is indeed taken by the government of india then it has to be uh, completely under my control they cannot utilize it etc so this was the argument with which we tried to persuade the supreme court we were unfortunately rejected and the supreme court seemed to be of the view that no uh, except the minority judgment which is authored by now chief justice chandrachud uh, uh, then a puny judge of the supreme court uh, uh, where he dissented in uh, puttaswami 2 and found that the program was unconstitutional the majority found that it was valid but see what happened so i mean at least the law as it stands just now is that for whatever 1/6 or 1/7th of humanity that is in india we do not have enjoy this protection that this part of our bodily integrity our own fingerprints we have complete dominion and control over but the jamaican supreme court speaking through chief justice Bra- uh, sykes preferred the minority decision of the indian supreme court and they struck down their program which was a, ni- a national identification and registration act program so you now have two supreme court judgments one the jamaican supreme court which is also considered as a very very well written and well considered judgment which follows our minority judgment and i fo- i i emphasize the minority judgment because we all started with the stirring dissent and the ringing dissent of justice h r khanna so i am not sure uh, uh, whether we will get uh, in the near term at least a reversal or a reconsideration but these are battles for liberty which have to be fought keeping in mind the great principles and the great uh, uh, which were you know the, the 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 principles adopted and followed and applied by justice khanna and that's an uh, that, that's a facet there's just two points which i want to mention in addition and i was uh, i i i pick it up because uh, justice sundresh also used that used that phrase and that is on intimacy privacy and intimacy is extremely important in so far as our personal relationships are concerned and we have no idea you know the traditional framework was the asymmetry between the citizen and the state and that's what all our judgments have come up with including the pucl judgment etc which was mentioned i mean you have the state the state is all knowing etc etc versus the individual citizen the asymmetry now is even more accentuated between big technology companies and what they know about each one of us and the very little that we know about them what they do with our data and equally how little the state which is our state at which we have created not just also in so far as the dealings and the functioning of big technology is concerned and the price which we may have to pay is in the realm of privacy and there are innumerable examples now because technologies were mentioned apart from ai where you have the smallest possible devices which can be used to record which can be used record not just voices but also images those can be placed on the net and that is going to have a dreadful dreadful impact psychological personal a devastating impact on the confidence of an individual unless you know we morph into some kind of post homo sapien kind of species uh, which says that no everything which we will do we will lead uh, completely open lives etc and uh, this thing i i want to end uh, so as far as the lakshman rekha is concerned i just 
uh, emphasize that it is, as Justice Sundaresh and I agree with him and Guru Krishna Kumar, that it's going to be a case by case evolution. The Rekha will keep moving as society evolves, as technology. But we are going to have to, and we are going to have to, both as young lawyers, have to learn and persuade our judges. I, I mean, I see much of the failure in Aadhaar as a fault of counsel, and I take some responsibility of it. That we were, you know, just unlike the Jamaican bar, which was so much more persuasive with their chief justice, that we failed to protect our own fingerprints, imagine, of one-seventh of humanity and our own iris scans. But that's for another day. And I want to end with a talk which, uh, and a quote from Chief Just from Justice Khanna's, a talk which he gave on 10th of January 1982 in New Delhi. And from what I could reconstruct, it was something called the Bertrand Russell uh, Study Forum. And he gives this lecture. And I'll uh, just read it out, uh, a couple of paragraphs, and uh, wonder whether this has some resonance to the current times which we're living with, uh, imposing on both the bar and the bench an, an, an enormous responsibility. His lecture was, of course, on freedom of media. And this is what he said. And I quote, it is customary, indeed it is fashionable, for the intellectuals and elitists to talk when times are favorable of freedom of the press and the freedom of expression are the most cherished values, values which are a part of the common heritage of mankind in a democratic world, values without which life would lose meaning and the benefit of all decencies. There, however, come periods in the history of nations when there is a challenge to those values and any talk of them becomes an anathema to those in power. Such periods prove to be crucial for they are the times for testing the metal of each one of us. It is at such moments that we need persons who would not deviate or swerve on questions of principles and would not bend or bow in the name of expediency before the powers that be. It is, to uh, it is no test of our allegiance to the ideal of freedom of the press to abide by values enshrined therein when times are normal and the sailing is smooth. The real tests and crucial moments arise when the times are abnormal, when there is a, bro a, a, a brooding sense of fear, when pressure sometimes open and undisguised and at other times subtle and covert are applied. And when any deviation from the views of those in power involves calculated risks and hazards, freedom of the press knows of no finer hour than the refusal to surrender or hypothecate one's faculties in the face of such heavy odds. And I end with uh, uh, Justice Khanna's quotation. I believe this has a certain relevance to preserving and protecting privacy. I thank you all for your time. And uh, I thank the organizers for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I would like to express our deepest gratitude and appreciation to our esteemed speaker, Mr. Sham Divan, for sharing his views on state surveillance and privacy, and also highlighting the Lakshman and Rekha in between. So you have inspired us with your remarkable insights and left a mark on our minds as well as our hearts. On behalf of Can Foundation, I would also like to thank our chief guest, Honorable Mr. Justice M.M. Sundresh, for gracing us with his august presence and insightful words. We are also very grateful to our esteemed speakers, Mr. Guru Krishna Kumar, Mr. Sham Divan, and Dr. Surya Prakash for their invaluable contributions and for being a part of the symposium. We would also like to thank NLIU Bhopal and HNLU Raipur for their support, and we hope to have your continued support. Thank you once again for joining us. Now we will be breaking for lunch and the post-lunch session will start at 2.30. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.